glad that you found our new location here at Eastward Elementary. So I'm real excited about this place because we get to be locked in here for the next year and not have to be worried about being shuffled around here, there, and not having space one Sunday, but having it next Sunday and all that stuff. So it's, it's real nice that we can do that. It's a lot better for our kids. We have a lot more space for them to go and do their thing and run around and all that stuff. So it's, I'm excited about it. So thanks uh, for being here this morning. I just want to take a minute and uh, acknowledge that, yes, today is Mother's Day. And, and for all of you moms that are here today, we want to honor you. We want to love on you and celebrate you. Thank you for being here. Happy Mother's Day to you. We also know that sometimes this day can be a difficult day for maybe those that maybe you have some prodigals in your families. Maybe, maybe you've been trying to have kids and it hasn't been in God's timing yet. And, and so today can also be a difficult day for some of you women. So I just want you to know we are here for you. We want to stand with you, sit with you, pray with you through that. Uh, and so happy Mother's Day. Uh, and, and even for those that aren't yet mothers, happy Mother's Day to you. In a way, you all mother us, even if you don't necessarily have physical children here. Uh, we love you and we want to support you and want to be with you encourage you in that. So we are glad that you are here today. For those that uh, have moms, make sure you love on them. We would not be here if it wasn't for our moms. And so happy Mother's Day to you all. So we are going to continue in our study of actually moving to the book of Acts for the first two chapters here these next two weeks. If you've been with us for the last five weeks, we've been studying the last two chapters in the book of John, John's chapter 20 and 21, and really focusing on the last 40 days of Jesus' existence here on earth. So we came through Easter. Uh, Jesus went through those trials. He endured pain and suffering on our behalf, took on our sin and shame, went to the cross, died a death that we should have paid, was buried, died. He was in the tomb for three days, but the tomb could not contain him. He rose again, and he is living and alive even today as we meet here. For 40 days, he walked the earth, making appearances to a whole bunch of different people to prove his resurrection. And so in the Christian faith, it is the one faith where we place our trust in someone who has died and has risen again, who has conquered the grave, who has conquered death. That what, that's one of the primary differences that makes Christianity so unique, is that we serve a living God. And so for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the last 40 days of Jesus' life here on earth, and just pulling out some things and, and trying to figure out how can we look at those 40 days of his existence on earth before he ascended into heaven and, and really even see and believe him today, 2,000 years later. So we finished up last week in John chapter 21. Pastor Dennis was up here filling my place. And I don't know about you, but I am thrilled that we have a guy like Pastor Dennis here to fill in and teach. I know a lot of you have been emailing me, encouraging me about his teaching. And so when you see him, give him high fives. Tell him how much you appreciate him. I love having him around and his wife, Karen. So we're going to transition over into the book of Acts 1 this morning. Have you ever waited for things? I mean, anything. Maybe it's a, a job promotion. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that you're giving over to God and you're just waiting. And, and you, you wait in traffic. You're, you're on your way to work. You get stuck on the Google. You are stuck there for hours on end and you're just waiting. You are waiting in the waiting room to see a doctor. You enter into the emergency room. You're delirious. You're losing pints of blood by the minute, and you're just sitting in the emergency room waiting for the doctor to see you. You're waiting, waiting, and waiting. You're waiting to pick up your kids after sports practice, so they're, they're there practicing, and then they're with their friends just goofing off, and you're sitting in the car just waiting. And by the time they get into the car, you're, you're, you're saying, I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? waiting. We have become a pretty impatient society. And I think that has to do a lot with technology nowadays. So if we want to find the answer to something, we can pull it up on our smartphone. If we, if we want to check in somewhere, we can just dial in our, our phone numbers here for our kids and out comes a ticket. And so technology has made us very um, uh, impatient, if you will. Growing up, I used to look forward to Saturday morning cartoons 
now my kids just turn on Netflix or they go on on demand and they can choose any cartoon that they want. They don't have to wait for the Saturday morning programs. Our culture has made us very impatient. The landline telephone. Remember that? Remember when the only time you had to talk to somebody was when you were home at night and, and, and someone would dial the phone and you would run over to the phone and you're like, oh, somebody's calling. I can't, hello? hello? Oh, how are you? So good to talk to you. Now that we have mobile phones, cell phones, as soon as somebody calls, we're, we're, we're scre- oh no, no, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that one later. Anybody, anywhere can get us at any time. Technology has has done this weird thing to us where we don't like to wait. And I think that has also caused us to get into so many problems in our lives. We can't wait for something. So when there's something that we want real badly, whether it's that piece of furniture, that car, that whatever, and we, we, we don't have the means to afford it right now, well, then we just pull out the credit card. And so we end up, are finding ourselves in a whole bunch of financial debt. I mean, you look at our country today, it's crazy how much debt we have. We're, we're impatient. We don't want to wait. Some of our social diseases have to do with our inability to wait, to, to delay our sexual gratification until marriage. And so we have all these diseases that are out there flowing because we, we can't wait. We want it now. Which leads me to ask these questions. Have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't. You know, you want something now and and God's telling you to wait. I think this can be the most frustrating. When when you, even when that thing that you want is a good thing, it's a a spiritual thing, it's a ministry thing, it's a a Christian character thing and, and God's telling you to wait, that can be probably the most frustrating. I mean, we've learned to rush one another. We've learned to to rush our spouses into a decision. We've learned to rush our kids into some decision or obedience type of a thing. But we try to rush God and that just makes it worse. He slows down. He pulls back the reins even more. I can remember the first pastor job I was interviewing for. It took six months. And for me, that seemed like an eternity. I came up, I did this one interview and then waited for a couple months, came back and did a a second interview, waited for a couple more months. I'm like, what are they waiting for? God, can you please move? Can you please hurry up? I I think this is what you're calling me to do, but why are you taking so long? Even starting this church, Mission Community Church, it was about a a year and a half to a two-year process trying to wait on God and see how God was leading and, and thinking that I knew what God wanted me to do, but still having to wait to, to see how he provided and, and guided in those decisions. Even, even this new location in, in this place is, is us waiting on God. So we're, in a way, going to be waiting on God for the next year to see how he supplies our needs and, and financially to see where we are a year later from now to see what we can do. Do we still meet here or do we take a bigger step and, and maybe find a, a more permanent location? Waiting can be one of the most frustrating things. And I think sometimes the most difficult places to truly see God and believe that he is at work is in those times when it's hard, when it's difficult, when there's trials all around us and he just wants us to wait. He wants us to wait on him and see how he is going to provide in those things. Can we look back on the times he has asked us to wait and see how he has provided perfectly in those moments? Can we remember those times and cling to those times as even today, there may be some of us here that are just waiting for God to move in some particular way. And so with that, we turn our attention to Acts chapter one. And if you were with us when we started Mission Community Church way back in September, we actually started in a series on the book of Acts. And so some of this is gonna sound a little bit familiar, but it's gonna be a little different as well as we look at what it means for us today to wait on God, and and more specifically, to wait on the power of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct in our lives. And so we're going to start in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 to start off. So Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt 
with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so as we were in the last five weeks looking at the book of John, we were looking at the resurrection in John's perspective. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at Luke's perspective. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. And so uh, Luke's account of Jesus' resurrection, the, the book of Acts is actually a continuation of that. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke. And so when Luke says here in first one, in the first book, O Theophilus, he's referring to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. He's continuing this idea of Jesus's work. So uh, I have dealt all that Jesus began to do and teach. So everything that Jesus began to do and teach when he was here on this earth, before he was crucified, before he was resurrected, the book of Acts is a continuation of how Jesus continues to do and teach in the rest of human history. As we come to Acts 1 today, it's this continuation, this sequel, this second book of Luke. He's writing this book to a guy named Theophilus. He is regarded as a Christian by most theologians. His name means friend of God. Um, some people think that maybe he, was just, he wasn't quite a Christian yet. He was a seeker. He was trying to figure this whole God thing out. And so Luke is writing this book of Acts to Theophilus to continue to, to prove to him this Jesus and all that he did and all that he taught. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So what Luke is saying here is like, we have to go back and look at all the different gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus basically gave this command to the apostles. In Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. We call that the Great Commission. When you go to Mark's account of what Jesus said, he says it this way, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. I like it how he says whole creation there. In one way, it's not just to other human beings. You are proclaiming the gospel to all that is around us. We are recognizing that he is the creator of all things. So we are proclaiming this gospel to the whole creation. In the book of Luke, in chapter 24, Luke says it this way, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he says this in verse 48, You are witnesses of these things. And then John, as Pastor Dennis wrapped up last week, says this in verse 24. This is the the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. One of the things that Pastor Dennis said last week is that Peter was given this this commission to, to be a preacher, to be a pastor, to care for the people, to care for the flock, where John's role, John's mission was a little bit different. He, he was a writer. So he, he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote the book of Revelation. And so he was this writer. And so John says in verse 24, here I am bearing witness of all that Jesus did in these books that I have written. And so when Luke is saying here in Acts that, that Jesus has, has commanded all of these things to his disciples, basically what he is saying is that Jesus gave this commission to his disciples to make disciples, to help other people meet, know, and follow Jesus. One of the ways that you do that is by simply proclaiming the kingdom, to share all that God has done in creation and and through the fall and through destruction of mankind and our sin and how he came to redeem all of mankind back to himself by dying a death on the cross that we should have died. 
and that he didn't just stop there, but he conquered sin, he conquered death to bring the kingdom to us here and now today. That's why we pray in the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are to make disciples, we are to proclaim this kingdom. And then in Acts, we get a little bit more of this idea of just simply being a witness, to just share all that God has done in our lives with other people. He says in Acts, in those first three verses, that that Jesus presented himself to his disciples in multiple times and in multiple ways. And we've talked about how this continuing continuing to reveal himself to his disciples at at different times was to prove to them and to show them that, hey, I'm not just the spirit. I'm not just this one-time appearing person that you think is happening, but I am continuing to reveal myself to you over and over and over again to prove to you that I am real. So it all started with Mary Magdalene in the garden. When, when she's talking with Jesus, not realizing that it is Jesus until she or until Jesus speaks her name. And there's a familiarity in his voice and she recognizes that it's Jesus in the flesh, that he is alive. He eventually appears to Mary, his mother, and some other women on their way back from the tomb to this upper room where the disciples were meeting. He appears to disciples on the Emmaus road. He, he reveals to them the scriptures, how the Old Testament links to Jesus. And then as they are breaking bread, as they do communion together, their eyes are opened and they see Jesus for who he really is. He appears to the disciples in that upper room. When they're locked behind closed doors, he reveals them, reveals himself to them. A week later, he does the same thing with the disciples when Thomas is there. And so he goes in and engages Thomas specifically. He says, touch the holes in my hands. Feel the scar in my side. It's me. I am alive. He appears to the seven disciples on the Sea of Galilee as they're out fishing. He engages Peter on this restoration of ministry. He is appearing to all of these different people. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, that he appeared to over 500 people at one time. There was this large gathering and Jesus appears. So over and over and over and over again, Jesus is proving his existence by just simply appearing and being in the presence of his disciples and all of these people. We come to verse 4 of Acts chapter 1. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus tells his disciples not to leave Jerusalem. Now, at first, that may not sound like a big deal, but let's think about this for a moment. Remember when Jesus first appeared to his disciples, they were in an upper room behind locked doors. They were terrified because they just saw their leader spread eagle on a cross. And so they were huddled in this upper room, locked doors, fearing death themselves because people were starting to identify them as followers of this Jesus who they just crucified. And so these religious leaders were starting to get after these disciples, were trying to hunt them down, and they were huddled in this upper room. So for Jesus to say, wait in Jerusalem, wasn't just this, okay, I'm going to hang out in my beach chair sipping on a, you know, a nice cold drink. No, they, there was a, a scariness there. There was a, a fear because they saw what happened to their leader. But I wouldn't want that for myself. I mean, they are just as humans as we are, these disciples. They are, they are impatient, wanting to see results immediately. And Jesus says, no, Wait wait. They were misunderstood, still thinking that Jesus is is supposed to come and and restore this whole political system back into the the hands of Israel. They're misunderstood and patient. You know, we may not know God's timing and we may not understand why he's moving and, and leading us in certain ways, but 
despite our impatience and despite our, our misunderstanding, he still chooses to use us. He says, wait, just wait. You know, I've heard a lot of talk and chatter the last couple of months as you get on Facebook, as you read blogs, as you uh, read different news articles of how our country is doomed for destruction. When you think of this political season that we're in, I hear claims all the time of, of surely the end times are upon us. Look at all that's happening. You know, they've been saying that for 2000 years. And I'm not saying that the end times aren't upon us. I mean, I, I do believe that we are one day closer to God coming back through Jesus and, and taking us up. I, I, I'm not minimizing that, but, but really, it has always been difficult. It has always been hard. And our, our current political system doesn't, doesn't mean that God is any less or more involved than he is. One thing that I fear one thing that I fear is when I hear statements or I, or I read blog posts from Christians about how doomed we are as a country and, and where we're going is that, that there's almost this attitude of, okay, well, I'm just going to sit back and not do anything because, you know, it's, it's in God's hands. He's going to do whatever. There's, there almost becomes an a, a incomplacency about it that we're just going to roll the dice and, and see what happens. I don't know when God's going to come back. I do believe it's happening. I, I would like to believe that it's sooner rather than later, later, but I don't know when he's going to be back. And I don't know how he's orchestrating all of this crazy stuff that's even going on in our country now. How he's going to use that to, to fulfill his plans and purposes. Jesus tells his disciples to wait in the midst of hardship and trial, to stay in Jerusalem, even though it might not be safe. Jesus tells his disciples that he's sending the Holy Spirit, the, the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. So here's the challenge for us. What if waiting on Jesus in the midst of our hardship and trials, whether that's individually or even as a country, what if that's exactly what he wants us to do, to wait on him? to see how he's going to move and how he's going to direct in those things. To trust in the power of the Holy Spirit, that his timing and his tactics are purposeful, meaningful, way more than, than what we think is going to be better. One thing that I might encourage all of us to do is in regard specifically to our, our nation's affairs, and especially as we come up through November and we start this whole election season and voting, read Romans chapter 11. Or I'm sorry, chapter 13. God ordains all of the world rulers. And it, it might not be what we think is going to be the best course of action, but we are to honor our leaders and to pray for our leaders and see how God orchestrates in all of those things. But in the midst of that, wait. Wait to see how God moves. We come to verse 8. Of Acts chapter 1. He says, so as you wait in Jerusalem, as you're waiting for the promise of the Father, he says, this is what will happen in verse 8. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, if you remember back in our study of Acts, verse eight here is really the whole theme of the book of Acts. It's the mission statement. It's the mission verse of this whole book that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and that's not an insignificant phrase, comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. If you look at Paul's writing in Romans chapter 15, he says this, that in Christ Jesus, then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. So he's reflecting on all that he's done in the ministry of the gospel. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. So if you remember, Paul's primary mission was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. 
for a lot of people, they thought it was just for the Jewish people. Paul was, his goal was to bring it to the Gentiles. And he did this by word and by deed, by preaching and by action, by doing. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Iliacum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. He says this later in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. The kingdom of God does not consist of talk, but in power. So what if our words, our, our gospel preaching without power wasn't or isn't the gospel? You could say, well, well, you can't solely base your life on an experience with God. You, you can't solely uh, base your faith on purely just experience, and I would agree with you in that. But if I just read the Bible and don't have an experience, then it's just religion. If I simply read the Bible and just do what it says, it's, it's just religion. If the power of the gospel rests simply on reading it, memorizing it, studying it, developing a systematic theology from the Bible, the Pharisees would have been rock stars. They were good at that. The great theolo theologian Bono once said, religion is what happens when the spirit leaves the room. Religion is what happens when the spirit leaves the room. So our goal ought not to be how much we can memorize, how much we can study, how much we can develop a nice systematic theology or convictions of beliefs. All those things are good. And I'm, I'm not saying you don't do those things. But if that's all we have, then we essentially just have an owner's manual to a brand new car without ever getting in the car and driving it. The whole purpose of the Bible is to experience the author of it. Not just simply see how much we can memorize and, and study and, and develop convictions and beliefs, but to get to know this Jesus that it writes about. And so when Paul says that, that it, the, the kingdom of God consists of, of power and not just words. He's wanting to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. To just say that we are Christians and to just believe certain things doesn't make us Christians, but as we experience Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit, that is an evidence of his working in our lives. And the whole reason why we get this power that, that Jesus says to you are going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The whole purpose of this is to point people back to Jesus. To be a witness that he says in Acts. Now notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say go and witness. He doesn't say go and serve. He doesn't say go and do ministry. He just says, you will receive power and you will be a witness. So a result of us receiving the Holy Spirit and the power that he gives us is going to result in us being simply witnesses of telling all that he has done. Some people are called to be preachers. Some people are called to be evangelists. They can go out to anybody and talk to them about Jesus and they get saved. Some people just have that gift. Some people are called to be doers, to be servers. All of us are called to be witnesses. To just simply share what he has done in our own lives. To proclaim his kingdom and, and, and see how people react to that. This whole idea of being a witness, the, whole, the, the Greek meaning of that term, witness, is the same idea of, of being a spectator of some event, of some sporting event. So one of the ways that I, I try to liken this to is, uh, many of you know who Justin and Rebecca are. Rebecca is one of our worship leaders. Justin is one of our board me members here at the church. And I can remember when we first started, when Colleen and I first started getting to know Justin and Rebecca, they were into these triathlons. 
Like, who would ever want to do that? Uh, especially um, at first, they, they started trying to convince me to get into just running, doing like half marathons and marathons. Why in the world would you ever want to do that? So as I started studying and, and just kind of researching what these things were all about, I, I mean, I grew up playing sports. I loved sports, but I hated this whole long distance running thing. But the more I hung out with Justin and Rebecca, the more they kept telling me about how awesome these races were and how you should do it and get involved. And, and so before you know it, I'm, I'm entering my first 5K. And then I'm like, okay, that was great. And let's go ahead and step it up and do a half marathon. Oh, hey, that was great. Let's go ahead and just cross off the bucket list the marathon. Let's do that. Well, it, it, it had physical benefits to it. It had emotional benefits to it. I mean, the, the whole stress relieving when you're out there running, there's, there's all kinds of good things. And so I, I saw it in their lives. I wanted it for myself, so I started doing it, and I started experiencing that for it myself. And so we simply shared with one another what we saw and experienced in the other person. I started getting into CrossFit. They started seeing the, the physical and emotional, mental benefits of that. I started talking to them about, oh, you need to try out CrossFit. It actually helps with my running, my endurance. It's, this is great. You need to try it. Before you know it, they ended up doing CrossFit. There's this, this spectator type of a, of a relationship where we're just simply sharing what we like and how we see the benefits and, the, and how things are changing in those environments that as you share those things, it starts rubbing off on the other person. To be a witness for Jesus is to simply share what he has done in your life. How has he worked? How has he provided? How has he guided you down life's crazy paths? As we live in the power of the Spirit we will begin to see things and experience things that we could have never imagined. I could have never imagined this a year from now, or a year ago, I should say. I could never imagine that. Even before I became a pastor five years ago, I could have never imagined even being a pastor. I was going down a totally different path. But God starts leading, God starts guiding, and before you know it, you're seeing his power right before your very eyes. So how can we see and believe Jesus today, 2,000 years later? He, he revealed himself to his disciples over and over and over again. How can we see him today? Live in the power of the Holy Spirit and be a witness of his greatness. Just watch and see what he ends up doing. So how do we do that? Can I challenge us all to just wait. There are some specific things that you are going through that you just need to wait. I think waiting develops character in us. I think waiting is, is something that God uses to just see how much faith we have in him, on his timing, on his plans, on his purposes, just to wait not get too far ahead of him, but to walk alongside him and wait. And while we're waiting, can I challenge us, us just to pray? Just to pray. King David says in Psalm 5, verse 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I direct my prayer to you and I wait. I just wait. I don't know what that looks like for you today. And that can be one of the most frustrating things that we have to deal with is just wait. But can I challenge us, us just to wait? Wait on him. Wait to see how he provides. Wait to see how he guides. Wait to see what he's doing in that circumstance in your life. And then number two, can I challenge each and every one of us just to step it up a little bit? Just to step it up, take a risk once in a while. Colleen was telling me this story this week. He took, or she took uh, Shane and Ellie with her shopping, grocery shopping. And they're walking into the grocery store and they see this homeless man on the, on the side over here. And, and there's something in Colleen's mind that, that says, you know what, I, got, I need to do something. I, I think I'm going to buy this guy a, a book in, in this grocery store. It ended up being a Christian book. 
So she goes in, she does her grocery shopping, she buys, picks up this book, and then comes back out to give this homeless guy this, this book. And before she could even get to the guy, Shane and Ellie go running up to this guy and sit right down next to him, pop right down next to him and start talking to him. Now, now you and I, when we, when we go into an environment like that and we see you know, maybe a, a homeless person, there, there's maybe a little bit of a, of a timidness you know, what, what are we getting into? What is this guy or girl all about? Like, it, you know, what, uh, I'm going to be a little careful. Not Shane and Ellie. Bam! Right next to him. There is a childlike faith, I think I just heard someone say. There is absolutely no uh, inhibitions with Shane and Ellie. They plop right down next to him and start talking to him. Colleen comes up and says, starts engaging the guy in the conversation, said, hey, I, I got this book for you. I, I saw you on my way in. I just felt like God was saying, hey, I, I need to get this for you. And I just want you to know that, that God loves you. I don't know what your situation is. I just want you to know that God loves you. In a way, Colleen and, and, and Shane and Ellie, they're just, they're just being a witness. We don't know where that guy is going to be a, a week from now or a year from now or if he's going to come to faith. We don't know that but you just take a risk and see what God does in it. They engage in conversation and, and Colleen asks if, they, if she can pray for him. She does. And then they go about their day. Can we all just step it up a, a, a notch? Take some risks as we wait on God and see how he provides. Can we do that? What does that look like for you? Maybe it's just engaging your, your cubicle partner. Hey, let me share what God's done this life, this week in my life. Maybe it's engaging that, that same person at Walmart at the cashier that you see over and over and over again. You're on a first name basis. You actually are communicating life stories and maybe it's time to step it up a notch and just take a risk. What does that look like for you? But in the midst of the trial that you may be in, the hardship that you may be in, just wait. Wait for his power. Wait for his presence. Wait for his direction in your life. As we look over this 40 days of Jesus walking on earth, this conversation that that Jesus had with his disciples before he ascended up into heaven actually would have taken place this past Thursday. That would have been 40 days from when Easter occurred. And so they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come for the next 10 days. They don't know how long it's going to take, but for the next 10 days, they're, they're sitting in Jerusalem and they're just waiting. And when we come back next Sunday, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, how the Holy Spirit actually comes, falls upon them, and there's all kinds of craziness that starts happening. Next week is known as the day of Pentecost in the church calendar. And so we're going to be looking at that. If you would, let's just bow our heads for a moment, direct our thoughts. Think about that situation you may be going through, that trial you may be going through, that hardship, that difficulty. Maybe it's a job opportunity. Maybe it's something you're waiting for God to provide in some way. Just think about that for a moment. And like King David does in Psalm 5, in this morning, just pray out to him. Pray to him. Pray to him in that specific situation. King David says, in the morning, I direct my prayer to you, and then I wait. So wait on him. And then in this area of just stepping it up a notch, is there someone that God brings to your mind that it's time to step it up a notch? It's time to take a risk and engage that conversation with that person.
So I would say even now, as that person comes into your mind, pray for that person. One of the things that Colleen shares with me is that every morning she just prays to have opportunities to, to speak to people about God, to speak to them about his goodness. And, and then you come across a homeless person on the way to a grocery store. So who is that in your life? So Father, in all of these areas of our lives, would you work powerfully in those? Would you work so powerfully that there would be no other explanation of your working than to to give you the glory for it? That there's no other reason why any of these things would happen other than your hand being fully involved in it. And Lord, whatever it is that we're going through, that you would help us to be patient and to wait on you. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to focus our attention on you. Help help us not to get so caught up in the things that are surrounding us, but just to wait as you guide and direct us through those situations. And in that, would you even allow that to cause us to see and believe you today? as we see your hand working in those situations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.